Oh, it's a gentle journey Worthy of the weight Like a wild goose flying With its only mate An all-enduring spirit On the whiskey trail Three, two, one Action. Here we are, episode three of Whiskey Unscripted, season three, and I am joined by my erstwhile co-host, it's Gordon Dundas, or Dallas if you look at my name, but yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can we just say, I'm not very good at lying, we've had a terrible mix-up. <laughs> we have had a terrible mix-up, but we're, we're here, we're, we're live, which is good. How are you, sir? Well, I don't think there's many um, programmes that... Um, sort of record themselves without recording but let's just put it down to experience but it was good having a chat with you it was good to have a chat good to have a chat <laughs> we didn't we weren't recording but we found it just in time um very well gordon um very well lots of stuff been happening in the last week or two with all these awards it was golden globes um yeah golden this globes week. oscars coming up oh. And the the icons and world whiskey awards, icons of whiskey, world whiskey awards, absolutely, there's been lots happening. Would you mind taking us through the world whiskey and yeah, icons like, awards? Yeah, the world whiskey awards. Um, you know, firstly, I think we'd like to congratulate uh, Tam Du for winning it single cask and White Cross. Well done, sir. Oh, He's well done, Ian. Cross single cask with uh, his selection has won its category, which is great, and. Uh, you know, a European oak example of Tamdu, absolutely fabulous. Um, uh, yeah, so well done, Ian. And that's and, great because uh, you know, you should say that's lightning striking twice. I mean, uh, Sandy absolutely. had to choose his one, which won the the world single cask, and mm -hmm. Ian's got to choose his one, which has got to be the. Mm. I'm sure it's, they're taking up from a range, so they've got to pick the right one from the right age, the right color, the right flavor. Exactly. I mean, that's exactly. Great. And that's what's great, you know, it means that, you know, Ian's, Ian, very, he's selected a European oak cask, Sandy selected an American oak, Sherry cask, obviously Tamdu only uses Oloroso casks, both those oak types. Very different, Sandy's was lighter, more vanillas and sort of, sort of creamier fruits. Ian's is much more that, I, it's a phrase I use a little bit, that sort of Sherry bomb style, that much more big, rich flavors from the european oak dark 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 as coca-cola i mean that that sort of darkness so absolutely fabulous and uh, it's a cracker of a whiskey uh, so yeah that that's that that's but, brilliant and just a quick word gordon since it is whiskey unscripted on the whiskey single cask mm -hmm. does it always mean it's better than casks that have been married together and no. put into a core range no not at all i mean i think a single cask is you you'll have a You'll have a rough idea of which cask may may slightly go off at a slightly different area to become a different single cask. But you know what what single casks generally show, uh, certainly from Tamdu's perspective, as far as I'm concerned, is the the quality across the board of the casks which we which we uh, which we use. And even you and I did a little tasting recently where we had two two single casks from they were clear, numbered identically next to each other. And the difference in them was immense. So there is no, there's no rhyme or reason sometimes why whiskies go off on a certain tangent, and uh, that's the beauty of whiskey, really. But um, you know, if you've got some, you know, John and, and the guys at at, at, at Tam do, we'll, we'll we'll have an idea that we want to keep that maybe for a single cask. We don't want to use right. that one. Um, um, but yeah, then again, of course, there's other casks which won't make probably be good enough for single casks, which can be used in in or. or you know, it can be used to better blend together. So, yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. It just gives me, a, I can almost taste the air up at Camdu. I'd love to get up to Speyside. And if you're watching or listening to this show, you know, you would not go far wrong getting up to Speyside during the festival or at any time. Um, no, just absolutely. Take in that, that lovely area. So, Gordon, what, who else won the Icons of Whiskey Award? Well, I mean, I think uh, I think the key thing about the icons of whiskey is that you know if we look at they, they look at distillers and producers and and all these types of things. So, distiller of the year. If we look at Scotland, I, I, they, also, they they do Ireland, Australia, yep. rest of the world, America, 
um, and and all those winners then go up against each other. We'll just look at Scotland because of the probably the biggest category, obviously. Um, and the distiller of the year was White Mackay, which is what I'm going to be drinking here. I'll explain a little bit about what I'm nice. drinking, but it's produced by White Mackay. Um, and then then they look at the craft producer, so the smaller producer. Um, so and Arbicky won that, which is a brand which is a brand run by a good friend of mine. But it's all about you know. All the all the grain is produced on the farm there, sort of just north of Dundee, and uh, so so they've done very well. Uh, but we start to feature a little bit sustainable distillery. Um, we were highly commended, so um, silver award, I guess. The winner being Nick Neen, which is um, which sounds like it's from a sort of I don't know, like Brian or something. <laughs> um, but Nick Neen Distillery, well done to them. But Glen Goyne, we know how we've been working very hard on our sustainability credentials. And, uh, you know, the distillery is very sustainable, um, as you know and can talk about. But right. um, but also, of course, we've now got the packaging, which is 100% recyclable up to the 21-year-old. Yeah. It's, and, it's, and you, it, you, you forget how important the sustainability is for us at Glen Goyne. It really is. I, I, and, and also for these awards now being featured, uh, that that's shows you how important exactly. being environmental and sustainable. And we've got a responsibility, I suppose, because places like Glengoyne and other distilleries are generally situated in some of the most beautiful parts of Scotland. Mm. And we really need to Absolutely. protect. And it needs to be much, much more at the forefront. I mean, it is getting there, but it needs to be almost the first thing we we now address as a as an industry is is this so and and tariffs in the US yeah which <laughs> <laughs> yeah so keep moving on brand innovator Ardner Merkin now Alex Bruce friend of the show uh, was on in the last series if you've not season if you've not listened to that fantastic listen great interview they did obviously they released their first single malt so well done to them but we did well I mean a full marks firstly Distillery Manager of the Year was Stuart Walker at Feta Cairn, and this is what I'm drinking. So ah. I have a Feta Cairn 22 uh, in my glass, 47% alcohol. Feta Cairn is a distillery that's been a bit reawakened recently by White Mackay. has very famous water jackets on the stills, which is all about the reflux and distillation uh, temperatures and things like that. And, and really, really interesting sort of approach to something very different in, in distillation. Um, this is- And Gordon, just on that, the water jackets, they're just cooling the stills down. I think so, the yeah. The, 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 just to, it's all about managing the amount of reflux, uh, which we okay. do through the temperatures of our distillation. And water jackets is another way of, of managing yeah. that element of it. And they sit around the sort of top half of the still just before the vapor heads off into the line arm, into the, uh, into the condenser. So Feta Cairn, well known for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so they have their water jackets. This whiskey, uh, Stuart, congratulations. I'd like to thank uh, Mitch Bechard for this from uh, Copper Cairn. Uh, there we are, Copper Cairn. I don't know if you can see that. Yes, but, you uh, can. He sent me this sample. So congratulations to Mitch. He's a former William Grant um, Glenn Fiddick ambassador. Um, and uh, thank you for this sample. So what is it like? Very fruity. Lots of mangoes, tropical fruits. Let's have a little taste, see what these oh, lovely. markets are doing. That oh, that's absolutely gorgeous. Very fruity, gentle, spicy, quite tropical, quite creamy. Very, very smooth. Lovely, lovely whiskey. I've never really drunk Feta Cairn before. Oh, I'm going to have to search it out. Gordon, I was looking for my Ian Whitecross single cask. Funnily enough, I found an empty bottle. Just a small bottle. But I have got myself, just to honour uh, the single cask at Tamdu, a lovely single cask here from Tamdu. Fantastic. Which aged 12 years. So, just, it's European oak. So, it's just... Very nice. Just lovely. Wonderful. Fabulous. Mm. Anything else caught your, caught your eye in the news? Yes. Um, I didn't want to tra tra trade too far away from the world whiskey, I got, uh, or should icons of whiskey, because we have our very own Stuart Henry, before we move on, from uh, Glen Goyne. Who the official, his official award is Distillery Ma Visitor Manager of the Year. Yes, Visitor Distillery Attraction Manager of the Year, yes. And so Stuart, yeah, look, Stuart's been at Glen Goyne for 
25 years now. Um, and he understands visitor attractions. He understands whiskey distillery visitor attractions uh, to uh, to a level that I've probably never seen before. So um, yeah. he, we would love people fantastic. to come and, come and sample that when restrictions allow us all to come and see the just a lovely balance between knowledge. I think the expression is you wear your knowledge lightly. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great way. I'd, th I'd say that sums up Stuart very well. Loads of knowledge, but you wear it lightly with a little bit of a wink and a bit of a bit no, of a flat. People are on, are on holiday when they come to visit. So that's that attitude as well. A lovely balance. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, that's so what I noticed. Really deserved. So Stuart will go up against the winner and the equivalent winner in Australia, America, rest of the world, which I think includes Canada, places like that, and um, Ireland. So, right. um, so hopefully okay. brings it home, brings the big one home. We'll keep you posted. And another um, friend of the show, one something Gordon, our friend Stuart from Tomatin. Scott. Scott. <laughs> Scott, yes. Uh, I'm Scott sure there's Stuart up there, but... Uh... No, no, Scott, you're right. Full marks to Scott Adamson, um, uh, Sorry, Ambassador Scott. of the Year. He's done so much for... Uh, he's done a lot over lockdown, and uh, he's done so well with being quite innovative and in doing things, um, and, you know, done a lot on sort of great content and if you've not seen a lot of that content have a look at it on tomatin.com but we had scott on as well and uh fantastic yeah Good. full marks full marks to scott as well so some great winners if you want to see any of the winners go to icons of whiskey.com and if you want to see the world whiskey awards winners if that's important to you or not uh, world whiskey awards world whiskeys awards.com now just before I do my other little bit of news uh, just yes. to say that coming up in whiskey unscripted Season 3, Episode 3, Ian Burnett, the Highland Chocolatier, one of the, and I'm not using this uh, phrase over dramatically, probably one of the great chocolate makers of the world. Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, he's a master chocolatier um, and he's a Highland master chocolatier. Uh, absolutely. And I think what, why we wanted to get uh, Ian on was... I mean, the, the amazing knowledge and understanding of flavor. But, you know, we actually, if you come to Glengoyne, you can do a chocolate tour, chocolate pairing with our whiskies and his chocolates, which have been specially made to go with our whiskies. So, uh, it, and I've done it a few times, as you can probably tell. And um, it's an incredible understanding of what, what, of how chocolate can enhance a whiskey and vice versa, mouthfeel, everything. Incredible. That's great. Before we get there, though, just a quick word about the whiskey auctions that have been hitting the headlines uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, almost the perfect auction lot, six point or six and a half million pounds. And the big prize within that one, the uh, rarest of the rare, a Macallan 1926 goes for one million pounds, Gordon. I mean, it's amazing to think that a whiskey that was, 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 was distilled in the year that you were born is i mean is incredible i mean a million pounds and i thought as a result of that gordon um because it's not often you you know who wants to be a millionaire no you, know, you would be an instant I'm, millionaire if you had a bottle in your shelf behind exactly. you or behind here we'd be millionaires exactly so i thought this might be a good opportunity to yes. to see if we could answer any of the questions the million pound questions from uh, from who wants to be a millionaire? Um, so I'm going to ask you a question, then you're going to ask me a question. Okay, now, here's a um, challenge. Uh, so we're going to keep on going down this list. So um, can I ask you one question, Gordon? Uh -huh. Was that bottle worth it? Is that uh, is that the right ask question to ask? I don't know. I, 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 I mean, is a is a can of bottle of whiskey be worth a million pounds? It, it's like everything. Uh, it, it, it's it's up to the person that's buying it, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is the whiskey sensational? Almost certainly. Uh, is the, I mean, the presentation is quite low key. I mean, you're not paying a lot for anything else. It's, it's one of the oldest whiskies in the world. So we know that whiskey is a commodity now. Whiskey is an investment. It's, it, you can make some money out of buying whiskies. So uh, a little bit less yeah. uh, maybe, of those maybe. bottles than there is diamonds or gold. Oh, or yeah. anything else in the world. That's there's not absolutely. many things yeah. Yeah, that are so rare. No, absolutely. And and you know, that's down to you know, I mean and what I always think is amazing though is if you think of when that whiskey did come out, 
whenever it was, you know, it, there was probably quite a lot of them were drunk without anybody ever thinking that they would be worth a lot of money. And that was probably even the case 15 years ago with a lot of whiskies. A lot of whiskies bought and drunk, you know, 15 years ago, as whiskey ultimately should be, um, uh, without um, anybody ever thinking they were going to make, you know, make any significant money from them. So, do you think, you know, Gordon, there's ever, because I, I do this all the time, I sort of bore my. My kids, I love talking about what will happen in the future. You know, be able to take your car and fly over the hills. Do you think anyone in the bar in 1926 was saying, do you know what, in the future, this will be worth a million pounds? I wonder. Probably no, not. I'm pretty <laughs> sure they weren't. But I think the point is it's a great... Uh, I mean, it, it's up to the people that buy them. You know, there's, there's a lot of people up there who want to have the oldest Macallan in there in their collection or whatever so it's like everything people collect cars people collect you know whatever and uh you know people spend money on very odd things and and uh that's just up that's just the way of the world you know um, and to be fair i was watching a program in super yachts just to get myself ready for when i obviously own one and i tell you what a million pound wouldn't even touch a uh, how much people spend on super yachts and even up keeping them going well, no, absolutely. Year. I'm, I'm, oh no absolutely i mean i've got i've got I, I do do a bit of sailing and i've been watching the america's cup from, from new zealand and you know there's a the british challenge have just crashed out having spent 110 million pounds and they went out in you know went out in, in, a, in a matter of about three hours racing if you actually add it all up that was it gone 110 uh-huh. million pounds of research and development gone so gone. yeah i mean it's that kind of thing but Getting back to who wants to be a millionaire? Challenge accepted, Gordon. Right, Give me the, the question. question. Glasses okay. are on. October, Whiskey is in hand. October 2001. Peter Spy rides. What was the occupation of the composer Borodin? Was he a naval captain, a chemist, a lawyer, or a chef? Borodin. Uh, we'll get five seconds. I would say, I would say, a, a, a composer. Ooh. I'd go for lawyer. No, he was a chemist. So, unfortunately, no. Next Cash one. my million pound question. Uh, okay. Um, you mentioned about the America's Cup. Let's go to this million pound question from April 2004. Pat Gibson had the uh, privilege of facing this one. Gordon Dundas. Which of these is not one of the American Triple Crown horse races? The Arlington Million, Belmont Stakes, the Kentucky Derby, or the Preakness Stakes? I've only heard of two of them. Um, I've never heard of the Preakness Stakes, so I'm going to go for that. Would you stack a million quid on it? No. Good, because you're wrong. It's the Arlington Million. So we're both on a donut at the moment. This challenge is slipping fast from okay. both of our grasps. Next. Uh, who was the first man to travel into space twice? Ooh. Vladimir Titov, Michael Collins, Gus Grissom, or Yuri Gagarin? I don't think it was Gagarin. Could it be the American Michael Collins? And then Titov and Grissom, I don't know, so I'm going to go for Grissom. Uh, you were right. You're yes, right. a million pounds! It's 1-0. Uh, Gordon, you've got this to... To oh, sort of draw level. Okay. Um, which boxer was famous for striking the gong in the introduction to the J. Arthur Rank films? Oh, I remember that. Uh, Bombardier, Billy Wells, Freddie Mills, Terry Spinks, or Don Cockle? I have absolutely no idea. Um, I have absolutely no idea. This is the draw level. If not, Gordon, if you hit Terry the Terry Spinks. See, either went Freddie Mills, 3-2-1. Oh, it's Bombardier, Billy Wells. We're both wrong, which means I take the million pounds. Uh, or at least... Well done. Yeah. Uh, well this done. week's challenge. Well done. well done, well done. So, so there's a million pounds. I mean, that's, that's, that's all sparked from that uh, rather rare bottle of whiskey. But it's amazing that um, the, the, the appetite for collecting Macallans that are out there. It's in these Speyside festivals, you see the, the roads sort of gummed up with cars. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, McAllen's a, a, an amazing brand, but it's um, it's not just McAllen. There are other whiskies that are 
proving to be that as well and will be the next McAllen, if you know what I mean. But yeah, but they've done he, amazing. Mike Ross done amazing. Or Sandy McIntyre, single cask. Yeah. Who knows in a few years' time? Who knows? Absolutely. And when you look at the quality of what's coming out of Tamdu, Glengoyne, but other distilleries as well, um, then um, I, I very much, you know, are more of a buy it. And if you're going to buy, if you're going to buy something, buy two of them and drink one of them. You know? Yeah. If you, uh, but anyway, enough of that. Let's get on to chocolate. As you can tell, a favourite subject of mine. Could I just squeeze in one last thing before we head on to the Ian Burnett interview? And that was, we did uh, items that um, have oh, influenced yeah. or changed the course of whiskey history. Now, we started uh, week one with a pair of tartan trousers, mm. signifying the tourist industry has grown up around the distilleries. Um, wonderful. Then last week, Gordon, you had? We had the Glen Cairn glass. And how that glass, I think, in the last 20 years has done an amazing job for the whiskey industry um so since we've got that. Tamdu theme this week it's about the oh the cork closure system mm -hmm. which really is now replaceable and before 1913 gordon you could not do that it was like a champagne cork driven in and uh, william teacher's grandson a William Bergius in 1913 mm -hmm. uh, patented this removable and then replaceable cork stopper, mm -hmm. which um, you really have to say that's fabulous. Really, yeah, kind of became synonymous with high end, with quality products like this whiskey here. So that was, and I think I think, I think that's a, a really really good one because I think you forget how it has defined whiskey in terms of if you look at them laterally and you look at old bottles of whiskey now we know that the cork closure can be a bit of an issue the modern cork closure is fabulous obviously and it's a fairly sustainable very sustainable industry um but i think you know to have when you just you know that noise is a fabulous fabulous noise it's one of the great yeah. And just smelling the cork, it's just a wonderful, as you say, these cork trees are sustainable, they can go for about 100 odd years, and yeah. you can still harvest the cork from them. And my little research tells me that just wine alone, 15 billion wine corks produced annually. Mm -hmm. and I think that's over and above the whiskey 14, industry. 14 billion of them are in my recycle bin. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so that was it, uh, that yeah. was why, and... Um, it's always a mystery how my wife can hear that noise uh, up a flight of stairs <laughs> and along a corridor. Well, that's why, as I said, that's why uh, when I was in a tasting and I said to the, it was a Japanese tasting and I was um, sort of in it as well, talking about our whiskies. And uh, I said, well, why do you use, a, you know, Yamazaki, why do you use a screw top? And he, he came out with that brilliant line of going, well, I can open my whiskey and my wife won't hear about it, but yours will. And I'm like... <laughs> Fair cop. It's a fair cop. So, uh, I know. Yeah. so the cork, the cork closure mechanism there, and I, just again, Highlands Stewart's Highlands Cream of the Barley, where the first mm -hmm. company to really to to advertise their whiskey with the fact that they had a removable and replaceable cork stopper, and the tagline was "Bury the corkscrew," and I believe that was from about nineteen twenty four, uh, but that date is up for some fabulous evaluation. So that's a. Uh, the corkscrew. Gordon, we're going on to the wonderful interview we conducted with Ian Burnett mm. yesterday, uh, the Highland Chocolatier. Just a word about food pairing and whiskey, because I know you've done a lot of them. Yeah, look, um, I, I, I'll try anything with whiskey. I mean, I, when I moved to Taiwan, um, the first three days I went to, I did to, went to a Chinese dinner, right, for a Chinese dinner, the big sort of lazy Susan in the middle, and there was, and, and, and I, I, there was a great, um, you know, Peking duck, Peking duck with uh, a particular sherry cask whiskey was just fabulous. Cheese and whiskey works very well. Maybe a creamy brie with a lighter bourbon matured whiskey. Maybe a a sharper, harder cheese. Maybe like a, you know, like a Parmesan with a sherry cask with high strength sherry cask whiskey would work well. Um, then you have um, other things that we've looked into: oysters and scallops and and seafood with whiskey works very well. But you know, there's 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 loads of different types of oysters that you have creamy ones and all this can feed wow. into that narrative of, of, you know, there's some real subtle flavors in whiskey and certain foods can, can lift that out. And, 
And that happens with chocolate, which is what Ian will talk about. I mean, it's incredible the the detail he goes into. I love the fact he talks about one field of cows that he gets his cream from. I mean, that's just you know. Yeah, there's a lot of synergy between single malt whiskey and and and, and Ian Burnett's uh, chocolate. Um, Absolutely. Making as well. So, and please, if you're listening to this or watching it, hang on to the last question that Gordon Dundask asks uh, Ian Burnett. I was having a look at the edit, as, you know, putting it together. I nearly fell off the seat when, uh, <laughs> when he mentions a great question, Gordon. Just, uh, just what was needed at the end of the interview. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I think people will enjoy that question. It was probably what everybody was wanting to ask. Uh, so, yes, yeah, I asked it. <laughs> and there's a skill there. So uh, listen, let's uh, see what happens when Whiskey Unscripted meets up with the Highland Chocolatier, uh, world truffle winner of the of the year, um, several years, Mr. Ian Burnett. Ian, welcome to Whiskey Unscripted. Oh, thank you for having me, Gordon. And and can I just say that's a fantastic hat. Uh, it's a great hat. What, it's great. What? It keeps on going way out of the picture. <laughs> Fantastic. That's brilliant. And I notice you're possibly in a roof space or an attic. Maybe it goes through the roof. I don't know. Do you know, when you have a chocolate kitchen, it's not really designed to have an office. So this is the attic above. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, Ian, I'm delighted you joined us. But just before we begin, for people watching or listening that haven't heard of Ian Burnett, um, could you explain a little bit about yourself and what your operation is up there just outside Pitlochry? Yeah, so um, I've become known as a Highland chocolatier. We're up here, um, as you say, in, in Highland Perthshire, uh, really a ganache specialist. So I make uh, the, the velvet truffles for you know Michelin chefs and um, hoteliers and uh, mostly in the UK. Uh, we do a wee bit of export as well. And for, you know, I create pairings. Obviously, what I've been doing for the well, best part of 15 years now is creating because uh, you're in Scotland, right? So people come to you and say, oh, you make me a whiskey truffle and you have to explain, you know, you wouldn't pour chocolate in the top of your 500, 500 pound bottle of malt whiskey. And it's the same with the chocolate. If you have gourmet chocolate, all these nuances, you're not going to do the same with uh, with the chocolate. So, so I started creating pairings. Um, so that's a big part. And the Velvet Truffles have gone on to win over 40 national and international awards now, twice best truffle in the world. So it's been... Um, uh, a long journey, but quite exciting. So, yeah, Gordon, that was yeah, that wasn't Scotland you mentioned. That was the best truffle in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So what? So what made a young Ian Burnett go chocolate? What was it that made you? I mean, was it? Has it always been a passion? That's, or that's it? my. It's my dad's fault. Well, actually, no, I blame them both. <laughs> no, my dad brought me up um, to to always help in the kitchen, and he was. Um, uh, not some fancy chef, but we were on the west coast of Scotland, the Isle of Mull, and uh, yeah. he used to have a thing about using really, you know, the best uh, Scottish produce he gets hands on and, and combine it with the more exotic. Like he used to do a lot of um, uh, Southern European, South American, and uh, you know, Indian cookery and so on. Uh, but this is all using sort of Scottish ingredients as well. So uh, and my mother's a perfectionist, so I'm sort of the combination of those two. And uh, like I couldn't be a chef, but with chocolates, you know, it's very detailed. It's very, if you want to do ganaches particularly, which are very awkward and difficult, uh, particularly if you don't want to put any of the additives in. Mm. Most even hand-making chocolatiers will put in a lot of the glucose, the sorbitol and stuff. But these are, this is a pure ganache with none of that. And therefore you have to, understand the natural science behind it in order to crystallize and get them that lovely beautiful thin you know smooth texture without any of that that crumbly greasiness um but if you try and do all that naturally it's quite tricky and that's the bit i enjoy you know it's not everybody's cup of tea but that's that's uh that's my and cup the, of hot chocolate well i mean and so you're are you originally from, are you are you from mull what is somebody originally from mull originally called? mull yeah the isle of mull but uh so are you parents, a muller or uh a muller no i wasn't born muller. there no i was born, <laughs> all right I was born across uh, on the mainland, but oh, uh, right. but only but, briefly. Tobermory? Tobermory, that's the one, yeah. So, um, Tobermory Distillery, obviously, Le Chieg as well. Um, Arden mm. Merkin around the corner, nicknamed yeah. nearby, full of distilleries now, there now. Um, I love Mull. I used to go there. I used to sail a lot, so they used to do a thing yeah. called Tenants West Island Week, which was... Well, my, my dad was a uh, big-time sailor up there, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, big fan of Mull. The Mishnish, great bar. If you're ever in Mull and things right. open up, Got to go to the mission issue. You know, that used to be my dad's oh. ad address as a sailor. You had to write the David Burnett, the mission ish, Tobermory. <laughs> Fantastic. What else? What, what more do you want? Brilliant. 
fantastic. You, you just, I wouldn't say glossed, but you just passed over um, the process. And I know, because you've come to Glen Goyne, gave us a masterclass. Could you just tell us the process you have to go through <coughs> in order to create these truffles without any of the sorbitols and artificial ingredients? Because it's quite, it's quite a, an org, a, a outfit you have to put on. Yeah, yeah, I think the um, uh, the starting point is the ingredients. You know, you've got to have uh, good ingredients. You've got to eat your way through a lot of different chocolate to to get to the point where you find some good ones. But um, we're we're talking so on the ingredient side. Yeah, you're looking for not a blended chocolate. Uh, you're looking for a single origin chocolate. Um, you're looking for um, you know this is the the malt whiskey of the, mm. the malt of the of the chocolate world, if you like. And you're looking for certain flavor notes. So um, uh, we'll probably talk more about it, but there's a Sao Tome curvature from the, the island of Sao Tome. It's quite a rare cocoa, but it's a very exciting one as far as uh, as, as cocos go. And then there's a, a, a special cream I use from, uh, you know, a local herd of, of cows and, uh, you know, actually here in Perthshire. But uh, there's, there's a journey to that as well and finding the right cream and so on. So it's not, it's not just, um, you know, the typical cream you buy in a supermarket, but it's um, quite, quite special. And... Um, and when you bring that together, you then that's when you start having to spend the time. So the velvet chocolate, yeah, it took about uh, three years to to create um, the first one, um, and that in terms of time is obviously a big investment. And then even now, it takes us about uh, well, it depends two to three days to make the truffles. Um, you know, so it's it's a very you can make a truffle at home in like an hour. You know, you mix up some chocolate and some cream or whatever, but to actually get that natural crystallization, that texture that's sort of hmm. a Michelin chef kind of level, you you need to spend the time on it. And um, but even for us, it doesn't always work. You know, it's uh, it's very labor intensive, but um, hmm. uh, and sometimes things don't always work out. So there's a lot of sort of micro development of, of uh, you know, every each batch, you know, we've, it's about a half a dozen different checks we do on every single chocolate at different stages. Um, so there's a lot of, of babysitting, if you like, the, the process and um, making sure it's just so. And of course, if they're not good enough, then we have to eat them ourselves. So, I guess you've come up with a few things that, that you think might be good, but they just don't work. And, and you, you yeah. sort of go, this should work, but it doesn't. Um, a bit like whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get some funny ones. You know, there's, uh, uh, there was one, one chef asked me um, to create a smoked hay truffle. And uh, that was that was a challenge. First of all, how do you smoke chocolate without? Because of I mean, it's pretty hard to bring in a natural smoke uh, in a warm environment when you're working with something like chocolate. So mm -hmm. anyway, we managed that, but frankly, it didn't taste that great. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we achieved imagine. it, but it wasn't a big seller. What can I say? Um, but no, generally, generally, there's a lot of experimentation. Um, you know, and occasionally you get an accident. Like there's a one that um, the uh, um, uh, caramelized um, uh, licorice ganache that I made that um, was actually an accident. Um, so you get things like that happening. Uh, that one was a fun one because um, I, basically I burned some white ganache and, and so I ended up with this kind of horrible grey mass and, uh, <laughs> and we were about to throw it in the bin but the staff had been sticking their fingers in it. We're like, oh, you know, no, 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 that's really quite good. So we had a bunch of this left over and I was taking it down to London um, Salon de Chocolat, big show, London, uh, chocolate show in London, to to test out in the public. With a, not that particular one, actually, it was all like uh, it was supposed to be a spices ganaches. I was trying to let the public decide, you know, what kind of spicy ganache, Ras El Hanout or or whatever, to the you know Moroccan spices for people to try. And so we tried to get rid of this ganache on them, right? And uh, they all came back to the store and were like, "Oh yeah, this is great. Where can we buy this?" I'm like, "No, no, no it's not for sale." You couldn't you couldn't tell you were just trying to get rid of it, but um, but anyway, it, it, long story short, that ended up winning the best white truffle in the world because it was uh, with a wee bit more of work, but it was um, basically a caramelized white ganache with a wee twist of licorice in it, and it does really fun things with whiskey actually, but um, it, it really brings out um, that wee note of um, licorice at the back of your throat after you swallow. This is natural licorice root, not like your scary black candies, but like the natural licorice root brings out this kind of, uh, uh, brings out all of the savory characteristics in, in, a, in a whiskey, assuming it has those, that kind of depth to it. So it's really quite interesting. That is interesting. I just mentioned there, um, Ian, you mentioned about um, whiskey 
and this is whiskey unscripted um and you've talked about a, a lovely flavor pair in here licorice i'm already thinking mm. of the glen going 10 but um could you talk a little bit about food pairings and chocolate and whiskey and why do they go so well together you know I, i'm sure for a start it depends on on the chocolate like i've worked with um you know quite a few master distillers and, and wine houses and you know, champagne houses and so on and quite a few of them although they're coming to me they're they're actually they think sometimes they think they're coming for a pr exercise um you know oh we did uh, haggis last month uh, let's do chocolate no we, no should we do cheese and it's kind of like oh do you know and, and some of them have had their fingers burned they've, they've done a whiskey or something with a bar of chocolate and it's been a rather cheapening experience you know um yeah. so so what we're not talking about any of that obviously i'm talking about like when i have a chef come who says like oh, okay i'm going to be serving this this and this on the menu finishing with pheasants you know what 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 kind of ganache or truffle will go with that what will work what will bring out the flavors and so on if that's what you're trying to do it's a really it's a very intensive thing so you're you do a lot of um you know a lot of nosing a lot of trials and you know a lot of messing around to 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 try and find something but when you get it right it's really exciting and i don't mean just well it's exciting for me as a chocolatier because the different expressions of whiskey will bring out will change will will accentuate certain things in my own chocolates which i think i know very well from you know you think you work with them for years and you, you know them but um a different expression will bring out different things in the chocolate but the same thing happens with the whiskey and that's really interesting because um if you know a whiskey and um taste a particular velvet truffle when you come back to the whiskey it's changed or i don't mean change i don't know it's just so different now it tastes like the chocolate i mean if there was like a i don't know let's say a, a peppery note in the whiskey that a lot of people just miss it kind of glosses over and this is like the you know the the, the, the experienced whiskey drinkers if you you combine it or if you if you pass on to a chocolate that when you come back to the whiskey that peppery note suddenly jumps out Mm. it's it's really amazing and you can even try that same whiskey with another chocolate and suddenly the fruity notes of that whiskey come out so that's when it gets really exciting because you're you know people are like oh, I, I, i've always wanted to tell people about that characteristic but they often just can't notice it they don't taste it yeah that's really exciting but that only happens if you're really really honest because you know you'll have people that say oh yes yes i can taste uh patchouli sticks with a little bit of uh, mm. sandalwood in the background and you're like eh, no you can't whereas where so when you're doing these pairings it's honesty is really important you've got to actually um say actually do you know i like the chocolate i like the whiskey but really nothing happens there L likewise not all chocolate will work i think um i feel very fortunate with it, particularly with the saotome curvature um Satomi so curvature has a lot of notes um, like uh, candied fruit notes um, as well as spicy notes um, like warm spice notes and then even after you've swallowed it has a sort of a woody oaky kind of note um, and, and it's not because of whiskey but I ha also use a, a very unusual milk chocolate where the the uh, lactose in the, in the milk solids are actually slightly caramelized so it's not caramel flavored it's actually slightly caramel noted milk chocolate Anyway, I've just mentioned a whole bunch of characteristics that you frequently find in Scotch whiskey. And it's, it's, so it's by playing on those a lot, as well as the ingredients you put with the ganaches, but by, by working with that Saotome curvature and that milk chocolate curvature, it really exciting things happen, particularly with, you know, so several of Glen Goyne's work really, mm -hmm. really well with, um, with the, uh, I've almost described some of the, you know, signature pieces there, but you've got, um, a lot of the signatures in the Glen Goyne range, for example, fit really beautifully with the Sautome, mm -hmm. um, which um, in, in its pure form, you know, mm -hmm. before you've done, you know, touched it. So, mm. so anyway, that's, uh, I've, I've gone on a bit there, but I was just trying to describe that the, yeah. it doesn't always work. Um, but um, if you, if you spend the time and you, you, you do it well and um, you, you can come up with that, those right combinations, sometimes supporting, sometimes complementary flavors, it really is fun, and not just for the hardened whiskey drinkers, but sometimes for people that don't really like whiskey, you know, uh, yeah. but they'll be able to appreciate it and access it um, through just tasting. Sometimes you, some I've had people, you know, whether they're pregnant or whether they're teetotal, who will actually, you know, nose, taste the chocolate, nose the whiskey, and, and they're learning all about it and appreciating yeah. it, even if they're not, 
forgive me, going to drink it, but um, <laughs> but they'll actually, you know, really uh, learn more about it. It's a bit like a, it's it's um, like a door for um, a wider wow. audience. I mean, I've done I've done a lot of food pairings with whiskey, and I've done, you know, I've worked for different brands, and I've done, you know, for example, we we did a, an oyster event with a particular whiskey I used to work with, where we had three different oysters, and we asked everybody to pick their favorite oyster that went with this particular whiskey, and. You think an oyster's an oyster, but the difference is huge in terms mm-hmm. of where they come from and all that sort of thing. Cheese, um, we've done, you know, I, I once lived in Taiwan and I, I went out to Taiwan day three. I did a, I had, there was a Peking duck dinner, which we had with whiskey. We had with a sherry cast whiskey, which was just incredible. You know, it was beautiful. Um, so, so I'm intrigued about, you know, we've got a, an interesting range at Glengoyne, for example. We do a whiskey and chocolate tour, of course, which includes your wonderful chocolates. And, you know, we have a lighter style whiskies. We have the richer, heavier style whiskies with the sherry casks. Is there any sort of basic rules that you go, well, that's going to work with that because of that? Or is it is it not as simple as that? Uh, that almost never works like so sometimes i get you know distillers saying oh we've got this new expression here are the notes tell us which the chocolates are you know, <laughs> and, and okay sometimes some notes are like the patchouli sticks and fairy land kind of notes and sometimes they're much more detailed but funny things happen like i was trying to describe when you're actually there with the nosing that particular expression and, and with those chocolates you, sometimes you get these real surprises, you know, like I just mentioned that um, caramel and licorice one, that that does really funny stuff. And some things, it, there's very few whiskeys actually that works well with, but when it works, you would never guess. A licorice? What's with that? You know, mm. uh, it, it sounds well, it's, very strange. It, it, it's a really odd flavor sometimes. Yeah. And everybody does, although the licorice you're using is not the stick that you used to dip in the sherbet. That's what everybody thinks it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, it's just, you know, that's the sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. So, so I'm, I'm have to practice. Everyone, you yeah. have to experiment. Yeah, no, and it's the same with whiskey, you know, mm-hmm. we, we're talking about a lot of new products and things that happen and you, you speak to Robbie and he shows, he shows you 10 Glengoins that never hit the market because yeah. it just didn't work and in theory it should have worked, but it didn't mm-hmm. um, and it's a similar thing, the quality just wasn't good enough. Yeah, so, so I'm intrigued to, so, so if I said to you in, in your chocolate making career, um, this, is, this is a two-pronged question, what's your sort of pinnacle of your chocolate making career what what's the thing that you think that was that was one of the best things i've ever done well i'm not there yet um <laughs> surely, surely world world truffle world is, truffle oh, yeah that must have been oh, something else it's good you know that sort of thing is great because you can say you know appreciation to the cows you know appreciation to that you know where they're producing that amazing cocoa and south home appreciation to the team you know it's all, all very nice but you know that the dark velvet truffle, one best dark truffle in the world. Uh, we've changed the recipe half a dozen times since then. You know, so you, you, there's no sort of sitting still. You're constantly finding stuff. Uh, like we have meetings every single week where we're talking about what what happened this week, what didn't work, what you know, how to improve, and you're you're constantly adjusting and fine tuning, sort of micro developing the, the the recipes and so on. So that never ends. So I, if if I had to pick something, I would probably say the the kind of, um, although it was long and drawn out, the eureka moment of, of creating that velvet truffle texture in the first place. Mm. Um, that was a really long, hard process, but that's kind of the building block. You know, once you've, once you've, got, um, once you've got the process of creating a, a truffle that doesn't have the additive, it's literally like you're talking about dairy and cocoa, you know, nothing else, you know. Mm-hmm. Once you can do that, um, that's your building block. So I guess that that would be a pinnacle if you want. And that was unfortunately years ago. Ah. I've got a little game here, Gordon. I've not told you. I'm not told. This he might loves, not work. I might edit it game, out. Man. He loves the game. Um, and I know it's very difficult because you've already said Ian, distillers say this and I want that. But I wonder because whiskey unscripted covers all whiskies. If Gordon and Das could maybe pick a whiskey, maybe two or three or four whiskies from different regions, different styles, and Ian. Could maybe suggest what whiskey would go, what chocolate would maybe pair. Okay, well we whiskey. could do that. Okay, let's go. Let's go extremes here. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's start off with something like a Laphroaig Ten, big, bold, smoky, maritime, a little bit, um, quite sort of uh, honeyed sweetness in there a little bit. But of course, the main thing is that big smoke that comes through. 
Okay. Lemongrass. That's really weird you should mention that whiskey, actually, because the chocolate I was about... And now I have to let it out of the bag. The <laughs> chocolate I was, I was about to not tell you about is that is goes with that whiskey. Ah. So, and, and, and the only reason I can say this is because I have actually... I do... I am familiar with that whiskey, and I have done a pairing for Lefroy. Um Yeah. It's a great whiskey. It's very bold. It's, I mean, it is a great whiskey. And John yeah. Campbell, we've had on the program, John, you know, John has been there making that whiskey for years. And he says his biggest thing that keeps him awake at night is getting Lefroy 10 correct all the time. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. So I'm talking about batch six here. I don't know which batch we're on now, but um, okay. uh, the, it was basically a praline works really well with that. I mean, you've got to have a strong whiskey that, mm -hmm. that, that for, to go with a praline. Praline being like a hazelnut paste so you've got heavier oils um so yes you're getting that nuttiness that goes with you know the maltiness but it also tends to go towards the kind of what you might call them the maritime whiskies you know uh -huh. the um uh, so anyway but this it's not it's a very unusual praline in that it's got um a uh, it's infused with lemongrass um which sounds kind of weird and that's why i usually don't talk about it i usually get people to taste it and then talk about it but um, but that's yeah. an unusual one because oh well, it's not that unusual. If you if you kind of unravel it all, you go back and you go wait a second. Uh, you know, in Thai cookery with peanuts and lemongrass, been doing that for a long time. But um, there's a wee touch oh. of lime in it. But the reason for these aromatic lemongrass and the wee touch of lime is because the hazelnut uh, praline is quite heavy compared to a ganache. But obviously with the Lafroy, it, it it does fancy things with the with the citrus notes and so on. Okay. Wow. Great. Give a, All right. Give then. us another one, Gordon. I know it's it's a I'm tough just, one for Ian, but give us a, another one. Um, let's go completely the other side of the world. Let's go to a blended whiskey. Let's go to something like Hibiki. Hibiki is a Japanese blended whiskey. Ah, I see. That's Renown, I've then. never worked with Japanese whiskies, but I'm I really would love to. Right. But tell me, okay. tell me something about it. Well, they use uh, generally they. It's a combination of three distilleries: Yamazaki, Hakushu, and Chita, which is their grain whiskey. It has a light profile. It has that sort of very sort of light, sort of fruity. It has a hint of. Um, you mentioned sandalwood. That is a note that comes in Japanese whiskey. Um, it has. I mean, it's, it is one of the finest blended whiskies, but it's delicate generally. Um, it's they don't have any of it left, so they can't. They don't have any to sell anymore, but. Very delicate and, and probably, I would imagine, quite easily overpowered by a mm -hmm. chocolate. So I guess something a little bit more on that delicate side. And if we were looking at a similar Scotch whiskey, something like Rosebank, one of our Rosebanks, for example, quite a delicate style whiskey. So if you've got a lighter, more delicate with those sort of subtle fruitiness flavors and those sort of gentle spices, and they also use a little bit of um, Mizanara oak, which just brings in a very unique profile. It's very hard to describe, but mm. if you had a more delicate style whiskey, what would you want to pair with that? It it's, is, it's hard to say. Are, are, there, are there any, you know, vanilla or butterscotch notes in that, or is it it's yeah, a little that. bit. Yeah, definitely. There is a little bit of that sort of butterscotchy note. There's a little bit of that sort of uh, in the background. It has that. It's just when you know that you think of Japan. I don't know what it is. It just has those sort of flavors. And uh, it's very hard to describe. I could call up the tasting note for the particular no, one I was no, thinking it's, about. It's, but... You never really know until you do it. But no, of course. Um, if, I, if someone was going to experiment, um, you, you'd probably go down something. I mean, I actually call it the mild velvet truffle. It's... Um, it's got, uh, it, it brings down the, the amount of Sautome cocoa. So you mm -hmm. don't have it, it's not as in your, it's not as strong. Mm -hmm. um, it's got more of the, the caramel noted, uh, a caramel noted milk chocolate. Um, and, and, uh, and what that truffle normally does is that, uh, and cer certain whiskeys, it's been really interesting. I mean, you haven't mentioned texture, but the certain whiskeys, it brings out the texture of the whiskey, which is really yeah. interesting. So because it's such a, um, the velvet truffle is such a, uh, it's a little bit hard to describe because as soon as you say um, buttery, people think oily. But if you have, if you're using cocoa butter, it melts below body temperature. So it disappears really quickly. So you don't have a, a heavy creaminess, but you have a creamy texture without the fattiness, if, you, if that makes any sense. So the mild velvet truffle tends to work really well with subtle, gentle uh, expressions where you really want the expression to do the talking because if you do to anything too strong, it's going to overpower it and you lose those really subtle notes. So that would be my starting point. But Yeah. 
Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's, it's, it, when you say buttery, what I mean is, you know, it has that real sort of, it sort of glides across the tongue. It's a little bit sort of velvety almost, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful whiskey, but it is renowned for its sort of subtlety and its, yeah. its delicate flavors would be things that you would say. Whereas obviously something like the Freug is a bit different, obviously. Um, and then, well, let's look at one of ours. And I know you've worked with work, work with us, and 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 so so let's go for a a classic Glengoyne Twenty One Sherry Casks. Um, okay. You know, um, first fill European oak. So we're talking, um, you know, a lot more of those sort of from the oak, the tannic, dry sort of raisins and dark dark chocolate would be a sort of overriding note. But I mean, I'm intrigued to to you've created something for this whiskey so i'm intrigued with how you came about that for those for those watching on youtube i'll just put the 21 up there to give you an idea of the the richness of that whiskey ian take it away no that, that's a, that's an easy one that one believe it or not but i guess maybe because i spent some time with the 21 year old but once we once had that bottle inside a giant egg if you remember as well yes yes yeah. so so it just that's I, mean, I mentioned it earlier that the you know, there's, there's certain notes in the Glengoyne that work really well, the Sao Tome Coco. That one, perhaps best of all, you know, um, because it's got, it's got quite a depth to it, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of richness, a lot of depth. And um, so when you're talking about a couverture, and I wouldn't work with just any dark chocolate, but when you're talking about a, a couverture dark chocolate that's high in cocoa and very intense, but not bitter, so you've got mm. cocoa beans, which have been really well looked after. So they're actually kind of sweet. Um, uh, um, anyway, I'll go on about that. But the um, the dark Sautome couverture has got, moves on beyond the intenseness to a kind of sweetness because of those fruity notes. Um, it goes goes through those spices you've got. Um, and, and that's partly, there's, there's um, I'm not sure if... Uh, I think we've all we've always, you know, with, with with you, we've always talked about the dark velvet um, truffle because we're it's all about the complexity and the, without being overpowering. But we also um, uh, paired that with uh, the raspberry and black pepper one I mentioned briefly earlier because it's a as soon as you replace the cream with fruit, so it's not flavored with raspberry. This is actually crushed raspberries with a wee bit of infusion of black pepper you're obviously talking a lot more about the fruitiness um, and you're bringing out the, the peppery notes. Uh, it's not so subtle anymore. It's a bit more subtle with the dark velvet, but um, the raspberry black pepper is really interesting with that expression as well. It's wonderful. And can I ask both of you, um, for those listening or watching, chocolate first, then whiskey, or whiskey first, then chocolate? Oh, no. Now, <laughs> go on, Gordon, you first. <laughs> well, I would say... And you probably completely disagree with me, but I would say what well, I how I would do it is I would take a little bit of whiskey first because of the alcohol. Get your mouth used to the alcohol, uh, assuming you've not had ten whiskeys before that, if you know what I mean. Um, so that's what I would do, um, and then what I would probably tend to do would be to take a little bit of the chocolate in your mouth, and then potentially a little bit of whiskey after that. But Ian, you may completely disagree with that. No, I don't. I don't think there's a wrong way. Uh, you know, it's like mixers with whiskey. You know, if it works for you. But it's it's. But also, you have different experiences. It's not like whether it's, uh, there's a better or a worse way. Even I, I tend to find because I do a lot with my nose, so I tend to nose the whiskey, taste the chocolate because it's not as strong yet, and then because you, you go back and forth. It's not like yeah, yeah. It's not just really linear, but. Uh, then I taste the chocolate and then once I've actually swallowed the chocolate so once the chocolate is in theory gone from the palate but actually it's still in the background obviously then come back and nose the whiskey before I even you know uh -huh. uh, you, you even drink it so uh -huh. the that path for me allows me to notice all the subtle things and the aromas and so on and the changes because really what I'm interested I maybe it's just me but I personally find the change in the what my nose picks up the most interesting part so the first nosing taste the mm -hmm. chocolate back to the second nosing and you usually find a shift you know something yeah. is altered and changed and then obviously you can then taste the whiskey you can then go back to the chocolate you can do what you just described as well but i like to catch those subtle notes yeah. first yeah, yeah th there's definitely one way not to do it which is to Hoof the whole chocolate in a one and all the whiskey in a one. That's not the way to do it. No. 
that's called the hot chocolate. That one. <laughs> that's fabulous. I, utterly. And finally, fabulous. can I just ask? Finally, um, since it is whiskey unscripted, and you've obviously got a, a good knowledge of whiskey, uh, Ian, it can be any whiskey you want. What would be your uh, desert island whiskeys? Get maybe top three. What would you? What, what, what's your What's your whiskey moment as well? Oh yes, oh, that's really hard. Um, because, you know, I wouldn't be choosing them because of the whiskeys. I'd be choosing them because of the experience. That's fine. That's fine. That's exactly what we want. Um, um, it, they don't have to all be ours either as well. <laughs> and and it re- I, have to reach, I have to reach back as well. No, I really, I really have enjoyed the, the, the 21, actually. I mean, it's good you brought that one up. Um, uh, because, because it's... Um, yeah. There's a, there's a funny synergy, I find, with the, the Dalmore, actually. Um, now I'm going to get the name wrong. Is it King Alexander? Yep, yep. that is that is a whiskey. Yep, from yep. them. Very nice. So, so that one is really, really I found really interesting. Um, and um, you, you hate me for saying, but I find a lot of synergy between it and the and the 21, the Glengoyne 21. But only because for me, there's a journey with the whiskey, and there's a journey through a chocolate. And I find um, the journey. The same reason I get excited about the 21-year-old and the dark, the Glen Goyne 21 and the and the and the, the dark velvet is it, I have the same experience with the the, the King Alexander um, that has that journey that that I found really really interesting. Um, uh, I think the only there, there is um do you know I always used to and this is where I turned a corner a few years ago was saying oh, blended ones they tend not to have enough interesting points in them to for for a really exciting experience, but um, I'm trying to remember. It, it was a uh, an Adelphi blend. Is it called the Adelphi blend, or is there? Yeah, I think there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I only was... mention it because it's a blend, and I found it. Wow, it's really still got depth to it. So I, I thought that one was interesting as well. I think it's probably what you would call a more high quality blend in terms of the amount of malt and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, love everything Adelphi do. I think they do mm-hmm. some really good stuff. And obviously, owners of Arden and can just round the corner from. Yeah. So, so I, f- I found that one interesting too. But um, I mean, I, I probably can't remember the names of all the ones that I've, I've had moments where I've been like, wow, that's really quite exciting, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, and, and are, uh, you a, are you a whiskey drinker? I mean, if you, if you, if you were in an nope. area where you were nowhere near any chocolate, would you drink a whiskey? I think if there was a whiskey appreciation society, I'd be in it. But I don't know. Don't drink it. Um, I, I never have. Uh, I just... It's, it's funny that because I actually, do you know, when I was young, I used to hate whiskey. I used to think, oh, yuck, you know. So the, the whole process for me in the last 15 years has been a real learning, real like mm. educational experience for me. Because I mean, I, I was just talking earlier about how I think for a lot of people, the, the whole chocolate pairing thing is actually can be a window. Um, if it's done in a way that accentuates certain notes in the whiskeys, because you learn about the whiskey through the chocolate. And that's mm. obviously the journey I've had uh, to, to the nth degree after doing i don't know like 300 different pairings um with whiskeys alone and that's so that has given me a real appreciation but i yeah i don't no i don't drink it <laughs> my final question i'm really wanted to ask is do you ever sit at home and eat a yorkie um that's flakes it's it's cabri's flakes yeah uh, uh, right yeah 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 um yorkie i, I have <laughs> I but mean, not for a long time yeah, but I just mean, do you ever sit at home and just go, I need to have a bit of dairy milk? It, on their own, it's fine, right? Right. But there's this scary thing happens, and it's only once you've learned you can't go back. Uh, because I grew up with Cadbury's, so I'll, I'll have that kind of, you know, those kind of uh, chocolates, and because it brings back those memories. Yeah. But there is a burning sensation at the back of your mouth that you end up with, and that's the reason you, oh, quick, another piece, another piece, until the whole bar's gone, then you feel terrible. Yeah. But that doesn't happen with curvature of chocolate, no. you know. So you can't, you can't compare one with the other. I mean, that's like no. apples and pears. But but that's why I think um, I'll I'll go for it because it's fun and it's not like you can't really compare one with the other. You can't. Yeah. No. I'm so just... you can totally enjoy. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if we're allowed to mention all these names online, but you, a, di- a bar of dairy milk or whatever, you can enjoy that. Yeah, but it's it's such a different experience from a curvature chocolate. Of course, of course. You're looking course. for all those notes and expressions. But yeah, no, I, just, I, I just wanted to see if I, you know, I just. I'm, I'm not a, awesome. not elitist about it at all. You can tell totally enjoy it. <laughs> Brian, that's... for those listening right now, how can they enjoy your chocolates? 
Do, do you know, I, I would say the best way is with these um, tasting flights that, that we launched. I mean, I mean, everyone's thinking about the pandemic and lockdown and so on, but that's been really quite exciting for people. Um, we used to have, you know, people come and we would take them through a, you know, a flight of, just like you would a flight of whiskey, the flight of chocolates and they get to, you know, they're all award-winning chocolates and, uh, but people would just, if you get a box of them, it's like yum, 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 they taste great and away you go. But you don't know why or the how or what's behind it. It's like someone coming to, this, to the distillery, isn't it? So mm -hmm. it's the same with this chocolate tasting flights we do. So we, we created a version where there's a, a recorded an audio guide, basically, for about 40 minutes. And it takes you through, you get like a flight of, of these uh, five chocolates and it takes you through and you get to learn it. So you have to guess as well. So it's a bit fun. It's not just some big lecture about how to taste them, you know. It's fun and you can say, I don't like, I do like, and, you know, and guess what they are and so on. Mm. But it's an experience. And I think that's been really uplifting for people who've been um, separated. People have been sending these, but they'll, they'll send a box to one country, uh, you know, family in another country, and then they'll get together on Zoom and they'll do this flight together mm. with the audio guide. And people have really loved that. It's been nice to see the... <laughs> The, yeah, the, and we and we've seen that in the whiskey world as yeah. well in terms of you know sending out boxes and giving people great experiences. Gordon was doing one last night. So, yeah, yeah. yeah no, look, fabulous. Thank you for giving us an insight into the world of chocolate whiskey and chocolates flavors, all those things. Fantastic. And we'll put a link on the the, the website and the podcast for folk to to hopefully enjoy those flights. Um, Absolutely. Great, Ian Burnett. Thank you for being our guest on Whiskey Unscripted. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. I would give you a drink, but technology doesn't allow me to put it down the, you know, not this time, but in the future, you might be able to get a dram through the, yeah, absolutely. the screen. Absolutely. Ian Burnett, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God, that was, ah, uh, everybody wanted to know the, the, the Yorkie. <laughs> that was, uh, I love that last question. Well, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I just thought I'd ask the question, you know, there must be times when you're like, you know, it's a bit like when you see, a, you see all these, you know, chefs doing everything, you go, do you ever just want beans on toast or do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, uh, I'm yeah. sure some of them do, you know. I'm sure some of them do, yeah. Um, but Gordon, listen, it's been a great uh, it has. episode. It has. Nice well, we've covered the out, icons of whiskey, the World Whiskey Awards, mm. and some great, uh, great dram there. With Tam Do, Yuja Fetter Cairn and Ian Burnett's whiskey and chocolate chat was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Absolutely fabulous. Yep. And uh, so, episode three done. How many episodes have we done now? We've got 31 episodes. I think this is 31 how episodes. Have, how I'll just give my friend a small drink. Would you like some? How, how have we managed to babble on about anything pertaining to whiskey at all for 32 episodes? That's it's my career in total. That so keep quiet, Gordon. So far, I'm getting away with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and no, I've got fabulous. no time to tell you about last week's burn suppers I was doing, delayed by a month. So great fun to those, and I've told everyone that was doing them to come and we'll listen or watch Whiskey Unscripted. So I'm hoping to get new um, followers. You can do burns any month of the year. Let me just say, wonderful, fabulous. good fun, F fabulous, and. I think we're going to have an interesting next uh, episode oh, yes. where we're going to be um, getting the getting the perspective of whiskey from another land, far, far away. Yes, I was going to start singing the song, but I better not. Do you come from a land? That, that, that. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. So that huh. is our Great. next um, episode. Watch us on YouTube, listen to us on any platform, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Yep, Instagram, Facebook, please, we'd love to hear from you. God and Pandas, all the best to you! Bye-bye. Cheers, bye-bye.